Internal combustion engine vehicles need fuel to operate. Hydrogen fuel cell cars require hydrogen fuel to operate, and battery electric vehicles require their battery packs be charged in order for them to operate. Refueling internal combustion engine cars is easy if you have access to a filling station of some sort, or indeed, an old-fashioned jerry can. You pump or pour the liquid in, and off you go. And it's usually pretty quick, well under 10 minutes for all but the largest of fuel tanks and slowest of filling station pumps. Hydrogen requires a little more complexity. It's usually pressurised and kept at a super low temperature to facilitate its dispensing in liquid rather than gaseous form. Again though, the process of refuelling a hydrogen fuel cell car takes anywhere from 5 to 15 minutes, depending on whom you ask. But the process of recharging a battery electric vehicle? That takes longer. If you charge from a standard household outlet, you could be stuck for hours or maybe even days if you have a large capacity battery pack and your standard household outlet only dispenses a kilowatt or so at a time. A domestic charging station is a lot faster, usually somewhere between six and eight hours, depending on the onboard capabilities of your vehicle and the capabilities of the charging station. Mercifully though, most modern electric vehicles come with some form of DC quick charging capabilities. Plug in, go grab a coffee or a bite to eat, and anywhere from half an hour to an hour later, your vehicle is more than ready for you to drive for another three or four hours without stopping. And of course, if you have the latest and greatest vehicles in charging speed, the Porsche Taycan and Tesla's latest Model 3, Y, S and X come to mind, then you are going to see that charge time dramatically reduced at sufficiently powerful charging stations. But for some people, waiting half an hour to refuel just isn't cricket, or football, or soccer, or whatever your favourite sports ball happens to be. And that, of course, is where the concept of battery swaps come in. The idea that you can replenish your car's state of charge in less time than it takes to use a DC quick charging station simply by driving to and using a battery swap facility. Historically, battery swap stations haven't been all that well received, but there's a new player in the battery swap station market by the name of Ample, and it broke cover this week with an ambitious goal to get one billion electric vehicles on the road and using its battery swap stations. Ample claims to have solved some of the issues of past battery swap technologies, and even says its battery swap stations can be sited without any pre-construction. But will it catch on? Will it really make a difference? And what's my personal take on it? Before I answer those, let's look at what went before. At the top of the list, of course, is Israeli firm Better Place. It set up a nationwide network of battery swap stations throughout Israel, partnering with French automaker Renault to offer its now discontinued Fluence ZE to Israeli customers, with battery swapping, battery rental, and conventional conductive charging station use all wrapped into one payment. And yes, I know the Fluence still exists as a Samsung vehicle, but outside of Korea, it's not available. Because of its essentially closed market, few cars drove in or out of Israel, meaning it was pretty easy to ensure complete coverage for its customers, Better Place promised customers a way of dumping the pump without needing to wait for recharging when on the road. The Fluence ZE's battery pack, unlike the rest of the Renault ZE family, was designed to sit underneath and behind the rear seat passengers and in front of the traditional load space in a sedan. The original goal of Better Place was to have its swap stations operate completely automatically, identifying a car as it approached, guiding it into place, and then dropping out the depleted pack for a brand new charged one. But in reality, the majority of swap stations ended up having someone on hand in those early days to help guide drivers through the process and deal with the inevitable teething problems. The stations themselves weren't exactly known for their reliability, and as far as I remember from the time, they tended to break fairly often. Better Place also operated a fleet of swap stations in the Netherlands, as well as a pilot project with Nissan in Japan. And eight to ten years ago, they really were the go-to for battery swap tech, until they declared bankruptcy. Having experienced Better Place myself firsthand in Israel back in 2012, I can say it was a good idea, but the over-complex swap process was nowhere near as fast or as convenient as it was meant to be. And as I've said before, getting out of your car every few hours to just stretch your legs and 
have a break is something that we should all be doing. Charging at a DC quick charge site for 30 minutes is probably making you a more alert and attentive driver than staying stuck behind the wheel for hours and hours at a time. Of course, we also had Tesla's battery swap stations. They were, to all intents and purposes, operated as a prototype project. And while Tesla did have a few swap stations, invite only, and even raced an Audi to refuel during a live stream to showcase the technology, people seem to prefer the confidence that came from just recharging their car's battery pack from a supercharger. And as Tesla's battery technology and charging technology has evolved, needing to stop every four or five hours to recharge, which is what most Teslas are now capable of doing, isn't really that much of an inconvenience for your average Tesla owner. There have been other battery swap stations too, aside from the battery swap stations operated by scooter company Gogoro, which are completely manual and literally require you to slide out depleted scooter battery packs from your scooter and then replace them with fully charged ones, a more freight-oriented system that seemed to make more sense to me was the Slovak-based Greenway battery swap system. First debuted in 2014, I went and watched the unveiling and we did a video about it that you can see here, the battery swapping system required no heavy complicated robotic equipment and relied on a simple forklift design to allow batteries to be swapped out at swap stations on the road. But Greenway wasn't meant for passenger vehicles. Its system used converted electric delivery vans and the drivers were given the training they needed to safely and manually swap batteries out on the road. As an option for freight operators with predictable routes, it worked perfectly, but for regular people driving regular cars, well, that system really didn't fit that reuse case. The most successful of battery swap stations to date has probably been the NEO battery swap stations operating in China, at least that's if you listen to NEO's own press team. Like Better Place and Tesla swap stations though, these all operate using just one type of battery, one design and so they're not cross-compatible with other makes or even models of cars. But that is where Ample comes in. Its battery swap stations are designed around a modular battery system that can be shared across different vehicle types on the market today. Its demonstration video, which seems to be a mock-up at this point, shows many different types of electric cars all using its swap stations to replenish their battery packs. Like most other battery swap solutions, Ample's swap stations, which by the way have branding that remind me very much of Better Place, use robotic systems to autonomously swap out the battery packs. Your car drives onto an automated lift, which identifies your vehicle, puts clamps around the wheels and lifts your car up high enough for the batteries to be dropped below. It's not 100% clear from the video, but it looks as if the system will then drop down a carrier pack assembly into which individual modularized battery packs will sit. Different vehicles will have differing battery pack capacities made of different numbers of swappable modules, but the modules themselves will all be common between vehicles. What's interesting about this approach is that it means the swap station can accommodate all types of different electric vehicles without needing to store make and model specific packs. But in order for the system to work, it either has to work with automakers to design and implement vehicle compatible carrier chassis onto which the battery modules are placed, including making sure that all automakers agree to use the same standard, or it would have to independently work on systems to offer customers an aftermarket alternative to their car's original battery pack, one that may or may not be supported by the automakers in question. I'm guessing that first option is the likely path, because in order to get those battery packs out, you'd have to ensure that you had accurate battery pack specifications and power requirements for every vehicle on the market, as well as details of how its battery management connections and communication protocols all worked. Not to mention a way to deal with the underbody aerodynamic panels that most electric vehicles have on them these days to improve efficiency. And frankly, if that seems like a tall order, it is. I would love to see something like Ample succeed because I think there is a market for battery swapping at least in the fleet vehicle market, where time is money and where fleet drivers have to be paid even if their vehicle is sitting there recharging. But for the private fleet market, I suspect the advances we've made with battery technology over the past decade. Batteries are capable of 
three times the capacity than they once had, and range has tripled by the same amount. And rapid charging is far more rapid than it once was. And that means I think we don't need battery swap technology for the majority of privately owned EVs. Even those who don't have access to charging at home are more than likely capable of finding a place that they can park up at and spend a half hour refueling every week. And while Ample's vision of being able to deploy pre-made swap stations where they're needed in double quick time sounds like an amazing idea, it also frankly feels like overkill for anyone not operating a fleet vehicle service. But the investors in Ample, they include some big names. Sure, the amount Ample has raised to date from its Series A, Series B and Venture rounds only amounts to 55.5 million US dollars, but those investors include Shell Ventures and Respol Energy Ventures, two energy companies who I am sure are more than eager to find the next big energy solution after gasoline and diesel goes the way of the dodo. Take Shell, for example, it has been aggressively working to expand its portfolio to include electric vehicle support. In the last couple of years, it's acquired charging networks, New Motion, Ubertricity, and Green Lots, and it is positioning itself as an electric fuel supplier of the future. It makes sense that it would also be interested in a battery swap technology that would allow car owners to refuel in the time it currently takes them to use a petrol station. It makes sense that it would also be interested in battery swap technology that could allow electric car owners to refuel in the time it currently takes to fill up their vehicles with dino juice. But the reality of battery swap technology is that while it can offer convenience to customers and it can add additional revenue streams to existing fossil fueled companies, it also sets up a future where perhaps you don't own the batteries in your car and maybe you have to lease them in order to use a swap station. And that will, I'm sure, put some people off. Not to mention the risk of getting someone's battery pack that's been really badly treated or isn't working. Sure, battery swap companies will have an inherent value of all of those end of life packs to help fund its costs. But as history has proven time and time and time again, asking someone to rent batteries for a car they own is pretty much a non-starter for most customers. Then again, Maybe I'm wrong. That's it for today. As always, thanks to the folks on my right for being our $15 to $49 a month Patreon supporters. Special thanks to our $50 a month Patreons. That's John Lyons, Raging Fellows, Anonymous Freak, Paul Conway, Laura Sandborn, Anthony Coates, Sean Ueda, and Tazla in the Gong. And our deepest gratitude to our $100 a month Patreon supporters, Marcel Ward, Jeffrey Songster, Reggie Watts, JP Fagerback, Will Graylin, and... Ian. You can join all of these amazing Patreon supporters by following the links below. You'll also find below links that will let you send us a tip through Ko-fi or Bitcoin if you prefer to support us using those methods. And there's a link to our Discord chat server, which is really humming these days and is completely free to join. That's humming as in it's very noisy and fun, as opposed to poo, smelly, hummy. And if you're feeling chatty, you should totally check it out. As usual, you'll also find everything from t-shirts to face masks and water bottles at our Redbubble store. Thanks for joining me, and as always, keep evolving!